At this time, let's return to 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 5 and 20 to 23. Last time, we dealt with the middle section, but today we will deal with the section that is uh, covering uh, those, the, that middle section. So today's scripture reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 5 and 20 to 23. This is God's word. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and all his father's house, house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, do not remain in the stronghold, depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Verse 20, uh, verse 20, but on one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safe keeping. Amen. What kind of people do you attract? And what kind of people are you attracted to? When you consider the people in your life, are you grateful or are you resentful? Are you proud of them or ashamed of them? Regardless, why do you think God brought them to you? We cannot help but ask such questions as you read today's passage. So let us examine what kind of people came to David and why God brought them to him. In doing so, we will see how this was God's gracious provision for his servant David and how it applies to us. The last time we saw David, he was all alone. He had to flee from Saul in a hurry. He had no weapons or bread. Neither Jonathan, his friend, nor Michal, his wife, could do anything to help. He couldn't even go back to his father's house. He came to Ahimelech, the priest, to get some supplies. And all alone, he had to hide in the cave of Adullam. Do you wonder how he felt? We get a glimpse of that in Psalm 142, which he wrote when he was in the cave. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. Verses 1 through 4. That's dark and bleak. How can we blame him? We all know that it is easy to absolutize how things are or how we are feeling at the moment and think that this present will always be our reality. But time never stops. This too will pass, as they say. We may be sad in the present, but we have not always been sad, have we? If we are struck by the sadness of our present, it is because we were not sad before. There was a present when we were happy or at least not miserable. If we came to our sad present from a better present in the past, the sadness of our latest present too will turn into something else. 
Is this just the reality of living in a world of constant change? What goes up must come down, and what goes down eventually bounces back. Life seems like a roller coaster ride. Keep in mind that this world of change is also a world of decay, with all lives eventually ending in the grave six feet under. Is our life nothing more than a roller coaster ride, simply going up and down without any meaning and purpose until we get off at the grave? The Word of God assures us, thankfully, that nothing is by chance because He's the sovereign Lord of all. No square inch in this entire universe, no nuclear particle in this cosmos, no moment in the continuum of time is outside of his sovereign control. Nothing can happen in this world unless it was first conceived and decreed by the eternal counsel of God before the foundation of the world who declared the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46:10. David was all alone. That was his present for a time. But a new present came to him as suddenly as he became alone. Verses 1 and 2, And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, and everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them, and there were with him about 400 men. David was not alone anymore. He was 400 times not alone. And even more, if their families came with them. Your present circumstances can change as suddenly as David's. So don't be proud and complacent because things are going well. And don't, be, don't despair because things are going bad. But there were these kind, but were these the kind of people David wanted for the change? Probably not. These were a bunch of rejects. Not the kind of people you wanted when you needed help. They were in no position to help David. Instead, they came to David to get help from him, a fugitive. How would you like it if God answered your prayer in this way? But maybe God does this more often than we think. I asked for strength, and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity, and God gave me brawn and brains to work. I asked for courage, and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked for patience, and God placed me in a situation where I was forced to wait. I asked for love, and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors, and God gave me opportunities. I received nothing I wanted and I received everything I needed. My prayers have all been answered. David might have said, I want help. But God said, you need to help these poor and desperate people, 400 of them. We are prone to self-pity. Self-pity is a bottomless pit. Its insatiable appetite cannot be gratified no matter how many people help, how much encouragement and praise people give. So one of the best ways to cure self-pity is to care for other people. When God brings others' needs to our attention and we obey the call to help them as the very hands and feet of God, then we realize that we have been blessed so much more than we have ever thought. That feeling bankrupt is not being bankrupt. And even if we 
are bankrupt, God can make even bankrupt sinners useful for his purpose. After all, it was never to be done by our might or our power, but by the Spirit of God. God wanted David to be a different kind of king from Saul. God wanted David to be a shepherd king who took care of the sheep of Israel, even the weakest and most miserable. But ultimately, the reason that God brought the riffraff was to lift David as a type of Christ. We'll talk more about that at the end. On this occasion, David was reunited with his family too. We know why they joined him. They felt threatened by Saul. They considered joining their fugitive brother and son better than just waiting for Saul's retribution, which was sure to come. Could it be that the final, they finally embraced Samuel's anointing of David as Israel's new king? Maybe in the beginning, they did not take it seriously because David was still so young. And the fulfillment seems so unlikely and far away. Do you also remember how Eliab, David's oldest brother, sharply and harshly rebuked David for not taking care of the sheep when David came to the battlefield and spoke disparagingly about Goliath? Chapter 17, verse 28. Would Eliab have done that if he believed that David was destined to be Israel's future king. Maybe the brothers were jealous of David too. Should they serve their youngest brother as their king? But you see, the dire situation which recently fell upon them drove them to cling to God's promise regarding David. You know how that is. When we are not poor in spirit, God's promises, however abundant and glorious, do not excite us. We are so full of ourselves that our hearts have no room for God's blessings. That's the problem with pride. Only when we are poor in spirit are we ready to cling to God and His promises. I'm not saying that we must be in trouble to be poor in spirit. Some people refuse to let go of their pride and self-reliance no matter how hard life gets. Others, though very few, manage to remain humble even though they seem to have everything in life. But for most people, it takes a huge problem to open their eyes and hearts to the promises of God. Do you see Saul's threat compelled David's family to side with David and cling to God's promise to their brother, though a fugitive now, that he would be Israel's next king? I'm not asking that we should ask for trouble. But I am saying that because we belong to God, even when adversities come, they are there by God's providence to help us see the surpassing greatness of God's promises to us in Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ Jesus, we can't lose. Because, if, because even bad things that happen in our lives work for our good. But I also need to warn us not to hold on too tightly to what we have. If we do, we will be too busy mourning the loss of these things to see and embrace God's magnificent promises. The quicker we let go, the sooner we will see why God took those things away from us. 
there seems to be another positive effect that God was working into this dire situation. Notice how this family reunion is described in verse 1. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Interestingly, David's brothers are mentioned first, even though his parents were there too. Why this emphasis on the brothers? To highlight the reconciliation which this reunion brought about between David and his older brothers, including Eliab. Maybe when Eliab spoke harshly to David, he spoke for the other two older brothers too, who were there with him, chapter 17, 13. After the reunion, this reunion, we no longer hear of any conflict between David and his brothers. It is true that we don't hear much about David's brothers from this point on, period. But we read in 1 Chronicles 27, and when a Philistine giant, Philistine giant taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, struck him down. We can assume that from this point on, this, from this point of reunion, the brothers stayed and fought together side by side, watching one another's backs as brothers should. Do you see? It took them this major crisis to be brothers indeed. Can we doubt that God used this crisis to bring David and his family's reunion and reconciliation? How are you responding to the crises in your life? And here in this passage, we see something else God did for David. Then the prophet Gad said to David, do not remain in the, remain in the stronghold, depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Can you imagine how welcome this divine direction was to David? When we feel lost and confused, what can be better than God's clear direction for what we need to do? Few things feel more miserable than not knowing what to do. But when we know what to do, we feel so much better even if what we must do is difficult. This is not to say that God was not involved in David's life before Gad came to David. David was not at all on his own, even when there was no specific instruction from God. God was there with David every step of the way. We get this from the rest of scriptures. If God declared the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, 10, if he chose us before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, if he works all things according to the counsel of his will, Ephesians 1:11, and causes all things to work together for his glory and our good, Romans 8, 28, so that not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will, Matthew 10, 29. If he numbered our days, Psalm 90, 12, and if he knows even the number of the hairs on our heads, Matthew 10, 30, how could anything David did be outside of God's sovereign will? Which, by the way, allows even bad things temporarily for the ultimate and complex good. Then why did God send Gad to David to give this specific instruction? He could have arranged David's circumstances to make him go back without this special revelation, could he not? Of course. But God did it to assure David that he had not abandoned him, and he would provide the guidance and protection he needed, both directly and indirectly, to fulfill his promise to him. Do you see why this direction was so valuable to David at this time? It was not simply because God was his divine Google Maps, conveniently showing him the quickest and the most fuel-efficient route to Israel's throne. The true value of this divine direction had to do more with the contrast it provided between David and Saul. God sent the prophet Gad to David, but God withdrew the prophet Samuel from Saul. 
God provided divine direction to David, but God kept silent with Saul. I'm sure David appreciated the practical value of this direction in this uncertain time of his life. But the narration of this story directs our eyes beyond the practical convenience to the assurance of God's presence and involvement in David's life and in our lives. God assured David that even in those dark days, he had what Saul did not have, God's presence and guidance. David had to learn to value these things much more than the crown he would eventually receive. Saul exemplified how empty a crown can be without God's presence and guidance. What do we prefer? To sit on the throne without God's guidance and favor like Saul? Or to be on the run but have God's guidance like David? I hope the choice is obvious. And I hope you know how you have so much more than what David ever received. What he got was like individual pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. But you have received the full jigsaw puzzle with all of its pieces in the Word of God. Not to mention the Holy Spirit who is there to illuminate our hearts to understand His Word. So would you rather have these little pieces of jigsaw puzzle for your life? Or would you rather have the whole thing? The whole thing is what you have in the Word of God. And you have access. God provides His guidance to you every day through the Word of God. It is only to our loss that we neglect His Word. And isn't it interesting that God's assurance came not when David was feeling all alone. You would agree that that's when you want God's presence and assurance the most. But not then. But when the 400 came to him for help and he had to take care of them. God loves us. He wants each of us to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. But Christianity is not a therapeutic religion whose ultimate goal is our physical, psychological, and spiritual well-being as individuals. Can we expect such healing and restoration from God? Of course, but they are not the goal, but a means. If we make our well-being the goal, we will end up like the Dead Sea which is dead because it only receives without any outlet to give. When we direct our eyes beyond our well-being to something greater, when we embrace the responsibility to care for others and become aware of our deep, desperate need for God's help to do that work of taking care of others, God will not fail us. And as we have our congregational meeting today, that's what we are being reminded of. Now let us pick up what we mentioned earlier, namely God orchestrating this event to lift David as a type of Christ to show something about Christ and his redemptive work. Doesn't this episode remind us of Jesus' gracious invitation? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. Those that came to David were, besides his family, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt 
and everyone who was bitter in soul. Similarly, Jesus extends his invitation to all who labor and are heavy laden. But there are some differences between David and Jesus because David is only a type and Jesus is the fulfillment. Notice how the people came to David uninvited. David welcomed them when they came, but he did not invite them to join him, including his family. He knew how dangerous they could be because he was a fugitive at that time. In fact, even after they came, he had to entrust his aged parents to the king of Moab, the king of a Gentile nation. How could he do that? What was he thinking? Ralph Dale, Davis, uh, Dale, uh, Dale Ralph Davis reminds us, that David's great-grandmother was a Moabite woman, Ruth. David might have appealed to that fact for the king's protection. It is also possible that Israel and Moab were at enmity, and the Moabite king was willing to welcome Saul's enemy. At the time, one thing is for sure, David did not have the power and resources to protect the people who came to him for help. But Jesus took the initiative to invite all who are weary and heavy laden. It was not that the people did not come to him uninvited. Matthew 4.25, great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from, and from beyond the Jordan. These were the poor and the sick, the social outcasts, rejects. There were sinners disdained by others. Some of them were demon-possessed. They or their families heard about Jesus' teaching and healing ministry, and they flocked to him from everywhere. They were desperate to be relieved from their afflictions, and they found their hope in Jesus Christ, the miracle worker. In this sense, they were not much different from the 400 who came to David. The 400 were not happy with the things that the way, the, thing, the, the way things were under Saul. The crowds that came to Jesus were not happy with the way things were under Herod and Roman occupation. They all wanted something to change so that they could find relief from their heavy burden and unbearable afflictions. But you see, Jesus did not wait till the people came to him. Knowing their afflictions, he took the initiative to extend this invitation long before the crowds started to come to him. Think about it. Did he not leave his heavenly home and came into this world to relieve them of their afflictions and extend this invitation? He knew even before the foundation of the world what they truly longed for and needed. Maybe they could not imagine anything bigger than a regime change. David instead of Saul, David's descendant instead of Herod and Caesar. They might have had a sense that the world needed a more fundamental change than that, but all they could hope for was a new regime with a better king. Israel's golden age under David and Solomon was as far as their imagination could reach. But Jesus invites us to something far better. He offers rest for your souls. His focus on the souls of men indicated the spiritual and otherworldly nature of the kingdom he came to usher in. That is why he prefaced this invitation by saying, all these things are revealed not to the wise of the world, but to the children. It's a different kind of world, a different kind of kingdom. Notice also how Jesus speaks of his yoke. Many theologians agree that he is intentionally contrasting his yoke with the yoke of the law especially the yoke that the Phariseeism of the day imposed on the people, which went far beyond the demand of God's law. The Jews could not even carry out God's law because of their fallen condition. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. 
even with all his promises of blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience, the law could not make people good because of the weakness of their flesh, Romans 8.3, and their sin-sick soul, Jeremiah 79. But the rabbis and the Pharisees, to be fair, out of their zeal to keep God's law, added one regulation after another to make sure that the Jews did not break God's law. It was like telling people not to drink at all so that they don't get drunk, even though drinking is not sin. These regulations were what we call the oral laws, which Jesus referred to as the traditions of the elders, Mark 7, 3, and 5, or the tradition of men, Mark 7, 8. These were indeed a heavy yoke to bear. To all who suffered under the yoke of the law, Jesus extended his gracious invitation. He offered them rest for their souls. Unlike David, Jesus doesn't have to take any of us to someone else for safekeeping. He's able, more than able, to give us rest for our souls for all eternity. Notice how this rest is found under his yoke. Unlike the yoke of the law, more precisely the yoke of the tradition of men, his yoke is easy. But what is his yoke? Is it something he bears? Or is it something he puts on us? We must say that it is a yoke that Jesus puts on us. Yoke represents our covenant responsibility to God. We cannot have any relationship with God without bearing a yoke because we can never get away from God. We must bear either the yoke of the law or the yoke of Christ. There's, of course, the yoke of the tradition of men, which is a deviation from the yoke of the law, but the two are essentially the same. But why should the yoke of Christ be different from the yoke of the law if they come from the same God? But that is precisely why we affirm that the demands of both yokes are the same, perfect righteousness according to God's law. But you know, how Jesus' yoke can be easy and his burden light, don't you? It is easy and light because he bore the difficult and heavy yoke of the law for us as our representative and substitute. Living the Christian life under the yoke of Christ is like reading a book just for our enjoyment not for a test. Doesn't it ruin everything? No matter how great the book is, if you have a test coming up, it takes all the enjoyment out. But living your Christian life under the yoke of Jesus Christ is like reading a book for fun, not for a test. It's like loving someone, not because we need or want something from him, but because we, want, because we just want to do good by him for his own well-being. Because Christ satisfied all the demands of the law. The law is no longer our enemy or a cruel taskmaster, constantly demanding from us what we cannot do. The law in Jesus Christ is now our wise counselor, the roadmap to a fulfilling and fruitful life, the wall of protection from the seduction of sin, on and on. We no longer have to be afraid that we will fall short, which we will. But we keep the law to show our love and gratitude to our wonderful Savior. When we bear the yoke of Christ, we will enjoy a closer walk with God. We will also see the beauty and benefit of his law and confess with the psalmist, I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. As we conclude, I want to ask you, in view of all these things, who are your people? 
Who do you feel close to? Who do you want to be around? Are you going through a David moment in your life? Having all these people? No help. But they need you. And they cling to you. But let us remember that the people in your life are there because God brought them to you. They may not be the kind of people you wanted, but they're the kind of people God says you need. Good for you. For you to love and care for, to reconcile with, to work together for the advancement of the gospel. Maybe you find even in our church family, some whom you find unknowing and uninviting and not particularly interesting. But think about it. We are all bearing the yoke of Christ together. Because you cannot be a Christian without bearing his yoke upon you. And we are all bearing that yoke together. We can make this easy and light yoke of Christ difficult and heavy if we do not keep in steps with one another by all of us keeping in steps with Christ. Brothers and sisters, as we conclude this year and as we give thanks to God for his faithfulness to us and keeping us together and sustaining us. Let us remember how Christ has so graciously invited us to himself despite our unworthiness. Let us also remember that Christians, even the most unknowing and contemptible, are God's beloved children, destined for unimaginable glory, even the least of them. No person of honor and power and beauty in this life will come close to the glory they will have and you will have in Jesus Christ. So let us treat one another with gentleness and love the gentleness of love with which Christ has treated us until that glorious day that is reserved for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise for your wonderful invitation. We thank you, Lord, that you did not wait until we came to you, even before we realized we needed you. You chose to be our Savior, and came into this world to suffer and die and rise again for our redemption. We thank you, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light because we bear this not for our own salvation, but we bear this as your fellow laborers for the advancement of your kingdom, as your beloved children, who want to delight and please their Father. Thank you for the rest for our souls that you have given to us under the yoke of Christ. Help us to experience that rest today and remove from our hearts our prejudices and discriminating spirits against others, even those who are among us. Help us, Lord, as co-laborers, as those who bear the yoke of Christ together, help us, Lord, to watch out for one another and keep in step with one another so that we can bear this yoke well, so that the yoke of Christ, which is easy and light, will remain so to the glory of your name, to our delight and enjoyment and to our mutual 
edification. We thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.